As we continue in our study in the book of Genesis, let's first of all look to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for giving us this great book. Lord, we marvel in what you have spoken to us and what you have taught us. Teach us, precious Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now if you follow along in Genesis chapter 16, verse 7. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence camest thou, and whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Wherefore the well was called Bir La Haroi. Behold, it is between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bare Abram a son, and Abram called his son's name, which Hagar bare Ishmael. And Abram was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. Now, this chapter focuses on two ladies, Sarah and Hagar, and how they both went wrong. The chapter open in verse 1 with these two ladies. We see them there in Genesis 16, 1, where it says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children, and she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. So here was a problem for Sarah. We see, Now Sarah, Abram's wife, bare him no children. That was the problem. And here was an opportunity that should not have been done, but it was there where it says in verse 1, and she had a handmaid whose name was Hagar. Now the next verse in our chapter reveals how Sarah was wrong in an unspoken opinion. Because in verse 2 it says, And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. Now from Sarah's wrong, unspoken opinion, this terrible plan was hatched. And the terrible plan was Sarah's proposal to fix the problem caused by God. This was Sarah's plan to solve the problem caused by God. The plan to solve the problem caused by God is given in verse 2 where she said, I pray thee, Go in unto my maid, it may be that I may obtain children by her. And from that point, everything went bad. Verse 2, and Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarah. But everything went wrong because Sarah had this unspoken opinion when she said, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. See, Sarah had a wrong opinion. It was unspoken. What was Sarah's unspoken wrong opinion? What Sarah said was not wrong. When she said, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. That was true. God was holding Sarah back from having children. Sarah wanted to obtain children. And as we've seen, the word that she used for the word obtain in verse 4 is the word bana, which means to build. It's normal, it's good for a wife to want to build her family by having children. And what Sarah said was true when she said in verse 2, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. But what Sarah was really saying, without saying the words, was her opinion of, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from something good. This was all about what Sarah thought was good. Sarah was saying it was good for her to build her family right then. And therefore, God was restraining her from good. Sarah was saying it was good for her to give birth to children. Therefore, God was restraining her from good. 
See, it's with this therefore of what Sarah did not say where Sarah went wrong. Was it true what Sarah said when she said in, in Genesis 16 2, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. Yes, that was true. God had restrained Sarah from bearing. Everyone knew that God either opens or he closes the wombs. And we're going to see that in, in four chapters later from now, how God is going to punish the house of Abimelech. And we're going to read this verse in Genesis 20, verse 18. For the Lord had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. So what Sarah said about God restraining her from bearing, from bearing was absolutely true. But it was Sarah's unspoken opinion that was wrong. Because Sarah was really saying, God was restraining me from something good. And that was the terrible step that led to all this disaster in, in Genesis chapter 16. And we've all been there where we see clearly that God has restrained us from something that we want and we think it would be good for us to have it. And so we conclude that God has restrained us from good. And therefore, sometimes we go ahead with our own plan to solve the problem God caused. Sometimes we go ahead to remove God's restraint and get it ourselves, and it results in a disaster. And this is what Sarah did. Where did Sarah go wrong? By concluding that God was restraining Sarah from good. How are we not to go down the same road that Sarah went down and fall into the same trap? And the answer is by firmly fixing two verses in our minds, which are found, and please turn to this, in Psalm 84, verses 11 and 12. Psalm 84, verses 11 and 12. If you turn to that, please. Psalm 84, verses 11 and 12. This is a very, very important verses here. These are very important verses and something that we really need to grab a hold of to not fall into this very typical trap that Sarah did in Genesis 16. It says in Psalm 84, verse 11, for the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Verse 12. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. So what we see in verse 11 is that we are first told what the Lord is doing. What, is, what he is doing, and what he is doing is told to us in these words. The Lord is a sun and shield. Sometimes we need a sun, sometimes we need a shield. And at the right time when we need the sun or, or something to be given to us, then what happens? At those times, God will be the sun for us. He'll be the one who give us, gives us like the sun gives raised so that the plants can grow or bana, be built up. But also, there are times when we need the shield, we need the protection to be protected from receiving something that is really not good for us. And at those times, God will be the shield for us and he will be the one who, like a shield, protects us from receiving what would harm us. You know, it's just like my wife right now, Cheryl. She's growing, she's always growing something. She loves to grow. She, she, I married a wife from Ohio, and people from Ohio have gardens, you know. So anyway, uh, so I, 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 it's very interesting for me to watch her out there. She's growing, right now she's growing romaine lettuce because that's what they had at Home Depot, and so she bought the romaine lettuce. And she's planted those little lettuce plants in the raised bed in the backyard, and, you know, because now we're still having some pretty hot days, she put together this frame, this kind of metal tube frame over the red ba raised beds there. And then she went down and she bought some shade cloth. And so and every morning what she does is she looks at the weather report and she makes the decision she's going to go out and, and either leave the shade cloth off for the day 
so the tender plants can get the sun and grow, or she makes this decision to put the shade cloth on uh, over the plants so they don't get burned up. And I watch her from the window. It's very entertaining. <laughs> but my wife makes the decision for sun or shield for those plants. She makes her decision for sun or shield based on what will be good for those, those little lettuce plants there. Now let's imagine that Cheryl made this decision that the sun was going to be too hot for the day, and so she puts up the shade cloth in the morning, and she leaves, and, and, and there's one little lettuce plant <laughs> that says to the other lettuce plants, and this little lettuce plant says to the other plants, Behold now, our Lord hath restrained us <laughs> from growing. I pray thee, take down this shade cloth, you know. And then all the little lettuce plants get together, and they take down the protecting shade cloth. And, and then what happens? They all get killed by the hot sun. Okay? So please write that in Aesop's Fables, and then I'll be famous. Anyway, so because when the time was right for Sarah to have the sun to build her family with a child, God was the sun for Sarah. And God, like the sun, enabled Sarah to build or bana her family by making Sarah give birth to Isaac. But when the time was right for Sarah to be protected from having a baby, God was the shield for Sarah, and he restrained her from having a baby. See, God was the shield for Sarah, and as a shield, it was true what Sarah said. The Lord hath, behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. But, but notice in verse 11 here, for we're looking here in Psalm 84, where it says, the Lord will give grace and glory. So for those times when God is a shield to us, and we with Sarah find it hard to, get, to not get what we want, for those times we have a promise in verse 11, the Lord will give grace and glory. During those times we, when we, we don't get what we want, God gives us grace. He gives us grace to bear it. And, and he'll show us his glory. What glory is that? The Shekinah glory, the glory of his abiding, the glory of his presence, the Shekinah glory. And it's during those times when, when God is shielding us from what we want that we're really in the pressure cooker and he's holding us back from what we want. And we say with Sarah, the Lord hath restrained me. And we can just feel when she says that word restrained, we can feel that word. That's a graphic word, restraint. You know, it's, a, we, it, it's, you know, we are so much wanting it. We can taste it. We're chomping at the bit. We're pushing against the bridle. That's the it's restraint. See, the Lord is restraining us. He's holding us back. And that's the time when we'll go to God with a broken heart and we'll experience what he calls the glory, his glory, the presence of God, his glory. For those times when God is a shield to us, the Lord will give grace and glory. Psalm 84, 11. But there's one principle that God wants us to have firmly fixed in our minds, and it's the next part of verse 11, where it says, No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. When we want something really bad, and the Lord is being a shield to us from that thing, when the Lord is standing between us and that th what we want, when we're crying out with Sarah, behold now, the Lord hath restrained me, there's one little word, one little word that we would like to remove from verse 11. And we want her to read like this. No thing will he withhold <laughs> from them that walk uprightly, right? We don't like that word good in there, because it, that, that, we want to remove that. We would like to have our own translation of the Bible, and we'll take that out, because we want everything we want. But that's a very important word, good. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Sometimes a sun, sometimes a shield, but always no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Sometimes a sun, sometimes a shield, but never no thing will he uphold from them that walk uprightly. Sometimes a sun, sometimes a shield, but always no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. And who's going to be happy? Who's going to be happy through this? Who's going to be the happy person when God's a shield? When God is in the words of Sarah, 
Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me. Who's going to be happy in that? The person that's described in verse 12 of Psalm 84. Psalm 84, 12. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. That's the happy man when God is a shield. Blessed or happy is the man that trusteth in thee. See, the happy man is the, is the person who keeps the word good in that previous verse. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Now, did Sarah trust in God in chapter 16? No. <laughs> Was Sarah happy? Was she a happy camper when she said, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing? No. Why not? Because she wasn't trusting God. Sarah was not described as 84, uh, Psalm 84, 12. Blessed, blessed is the man that trusts in thee. And so what we, have, uh, what we see here is this terrible disaster. Now, we've all been there. We've all been there. So before we jump on Sarah and say, how can you do such a thing? We've all done that. I remember back in 1982. That's a long time ago. Many of you didn't know that I was born then, before then, but I was. <laughs> But I remember in 1982 how at Scantabodies we had large orders at that time for human serum. And in order to make the large orders of human serum, we needed large amounts of human plasma. And where did the human plasma come from? Well, one of the places is the, is the good old American Red Cross. And, I, and for a year, I worked really hard to get one-year contracts from American Red Cross in San Diego. I don't, you may you don't know. It, there used to be an American Red Cross in San Diego. It wasn't all San Diego Blood Bank. Anyway, I worked really hard to get the one-year contract from the American Red Cross of San Diego and the American Red Cross of Chicago. And, and, I, and, I, and I remember when those Red Cross units told me that I was not accepted, that I did not get those contracts. And I was shocked. And it really hit me hard. And I felt like Sarah did. Behold, the Lord hath restrained me. And I didn't know it. But at that time, we were in the process of becoming deeply overextended. And it turned out that we didn't need all that plasma from the American Red Cross of San Diego and Chicago. It turned out that the plasma from the American Red Cross here and in, in, in Chicago was way more than we needed. And with the obligation to pay for those contracts month by month for that plasma we didn't need, it would have killed us. And so instead, I found plasma in smaller amounts for half the price. It was half the price that perfectly matched our need. Now, what happened? The Lord was a shield to me from those contracts. Those contracts were not a good thing for me then. So no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly, uprightly. But the no good things he did withhold. Now, we've been studying the person of Hagar, and, and, she, and we all know that Hagar was, uh, she was an Egyptian. She was a Gentile. She wasn't a Hebrew. And when we've looked at the life of Hagar, what we've seen in her life is one mercy after another. We followed Abraham's caravan, which is like, the, uh, is like the tabernacle. It was really like the tabernacle as it moved through the desert. And God had called Abraham and Ur of the Chaldees, and Abraham obeyed God, and God was with Abraham as he moved from in the desert from place to place, from Ur to Haran to Canaan to Egypt and back, and wherever Abraham's caravan went and he encountered people, those people encountered God. And because Abraham was an ambassador for God, just like we're ambassadors for God, where it says that in 2 Corinthians 5, 19 through 20, to wit or to witness that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their sins unto them, committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. That's Abraham. Abraham was an ambassador for Jehovah Jesus as he traveled from people to people. And there's one very important truth that God said about Abraham. Very important. And please turn to that in, in Genesis 18. We're going to come to it, but we're going to look at it now because here God is speaking about Abraham 
and he's, and he's saying something about them that's very important, and it's true. it was true then, and it's true now in, in, in our passage here in, in Genesis 16, 17. Here we are. And what it, this is is in Genesis 18, 17 through 19, where the Lord speaking to Abraham says these things. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? So here we can see God. He's having a conversation amongst the Godhead. He's asking a question. We're discussing it. Shall I hide from Abraham the thing that I do? And then, and then he says in verse 18, Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. And then he says in verse 19, For I know him. God said, I know Abraham, I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. So God says about Abraham, I know Abraham, I know him. And what did God know about Abraham? He says that Abraham would command that is the word that he used. It's a very strong word, command. It's the tzava in Hebrew, tzava. And tzava is the same word that God used in Genesis 2, 16 through 17, in that passage we covered where it says, and the Lord commanded, tzava, the Lord commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Very strong word. Tzava, commanded. So, in Genesis 2, 16 through 17, God commanded Adam, Tzava, commanded Adam, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and he gave him a warning. In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, that was in Genesis 2, 16 through 17. Then... Four verses later, after Genesis 2.17, four verses later, after God had commanded Adam to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what did God do? He created Eve. So in Genesis 2.21 through 22, we read, after God commanded Adam, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh. Instead, there a rib which he made which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and then he brought her unto the man. There's no record. There's no record of God commanding Eve directly. There's no record of God uh, 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 commanding or tzava, Eve, to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil with the warning that in the day that she ate it, she ate thereof, that she would surely die. See, God commanded Sava Adam to not eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil with the warning, in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Then God expected Adam to command, or Sava Eve, to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of, of good and evil and to, and to pass on God's warning to her in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. God did not say about Adam what he said about Abraham. He didn't say that about Adam. God did not say about Adam, for I know him, that he will command Zava, Eve after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment the Lord may bring upon Adam, that which he has spoken of him. See, but God did say that about Abraham. And it's very important when he said that in verse 19, Genesis 18, 19, for I know him that he will command, Saba, his children and his household after him. They'll keep the way of the Lord to do justice, judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which you have spoken of him. And Abraham did not just command, Saba, his children, but the verse says Abraham also commanded, Saba, his household after him. That meant that Abraham made sure that all the folks in his caravan were, that, that, that were following Abraham to keep the way of the Lord. That meant that Abraham set his caravan in order 
to follow God. That's another word, another meaning of the word sava, to order. God said in several places, put your house in order, you're going to die. That's the word sava also. That meant that all anyone had to do was to look at Abraham's life and how he ordered his family and his caravan, and they would see what it does it mean to keep the way of the Lord. What does it mean to lead a caravan spiritually? They would see Abraham leading his caravan to keep the way of the Lord by worshiping Jehovah Jesus. And when Abraham spoke of God, they would see a man who believed that Jehovah Jesus is the God of gods and Lord of lords, showing the truth of Deuteronomy 10, 17, where it says, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, ter mighty, terrible. They would see Abraham leading his caravan to keep the way of the Lord by, by when they saw him praying to Jehovah Jesus when they had needs, when he had needs. And they would understand the truth of Psalm 46.1. God is our refuge and strength. Very present help in time of trouble. And Abraham had plenty of trouble. And so they, they would understand that when they, they would see a, a, a life... Uh, a living life example of Hebrews 4.16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. They would see Abraham. They would see him leading his caravan to keep the way of the Lord by giving thanks to Jehovah Jesus. And they would understand the truth of Psalm 136.2. Oh, give thanks unto the God of gods for his mercy endureth forever. And when Abraham met that godly person, Melchizedek, and they all watched Abraham do what we've seen in Genesis 14, 20, and he gave him tithes of all, when everyone in Abraham's caravan saw Abraham honor God by giving a tenth to Melchizedek, they all would say, yep, that's Abraham. That's my leader. Exactly what I expected of him. That's, that's Abraham. And they would see Abraham leading his caravan to keep the way of the Lord by honoring Jehovah Jesus with a life that's holy and true and avoiding any appearance of evil. And especially everyone in the caravan, you can imagine, crowded around and watched as Abraham refused to take any wealth that originated with the king of Sodom in his wicked ways. And Abraham said in Genesis 14, 22, as we've seen already, 23, and he said to the king of Sodom, I lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread, even to a shoe latchet, that which, uh, that I'll not take anything as thine, lest thou should say, I've made Abraham rich. And everybody saw that? Abraham do that? Abraham to refuse anything to the king of Sodom? And they all said, yep, that's Abraham. That's our leader. That's exactly what I expected Abraham to do. And they would see Abraham leading his caravan and keeping the way of the Lord by sacrificing to Jehovah Jesus. And they would come to understand the truth, the kernel of truth in Leviticus 16.11, that the life of the flesh was given by God and it's in the blood. And God gave it upon the altar to make an atonement for the souls. It's the blood that makes an atonement for the souls. And when Abraham fell into sin, as they watched him do that too, they would see Abraham leading his caravan to keep the way of the Lord by confessing and forsaking and asking forgiveness from Jehovah Jesus as they saw Abraham run to his altar during those times. And every time they'd see him do that, they'd say, yep, that's Abraham. And everyone in Abraham's caravan would be led to Jehovah Jesus because of what God said about Abraham in this verse in Genesis 18, 19. I know him, that he will command Zavah, his children and his household after him, that they shall keep the way of the Lord. So the question is, we looked at Adam, God couldn't say that about Adam. We look at Abraham, God said that about Abraham. And the question is, what does he say about us? When God looks at us, would he say the words of Genesis 18, 19? I know him. That he'll command Zavah, his household and his, his children, his household, that they'll keep after him, they'll keep the way of the Lord. And the point is, is that God did say this about Abraham, which means that wherever Abraham went, he was an ambassador for God. And Abraham showed to those who saw his caravan when, when it, what it looked like 
for a spiritual leader to command Sava, his children and his household after him, that they should keep the way of the Lord. And whoever came to be a part, whoever was so fortunate, so blessed by God to become a part of Abraham's caravan, came under, under Abraham's Sava, came under Abraham's command after him to keep the way of the Lord. And when Hagar became a part of Abraham's car caravan, she came under this Abraham's command of Sava after him to keep the way of the Lord. And it was a great mercy for, for, Sarah, for Hagar. It was a great mercy for Hagar. Hagar met Jehovah Jesus under Abraham's command in Abraham's caravan. And because Hagar came under, came into Abraham's caravan, Hagar could say, she could say the words of Ephesians 2, 12 to 14. She could say, at that time, I was without Jehovah Jesus. I was an alien from the commonwealth of Jehovah Jesus. I was a stranger from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. But now, in Jehovah Jesus, under Abraham's command, I, who was far off, have been made nigh by the future blood of Jehovah Jesus. He's my peace. She could say all those things. And Hagar could say that because she became a part of Abraham's caravan. It was, Hagar could say, it was the mercy of God when I became a part of Abraham's caravan. And when Abraham... And when Hagar then had this terrible experience, which she did, that resulted in her being driven out of the caravan to a fountain all alone out there in the desert, no provision, no protection, and, but Hagar could say that it was so good to have God find me that she could say it was the mercy of God when I was driven out of this caravan to this lone fountain out in the desert because that's where God found me. And when Hagar was crying her heart out at that, 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 that fountain there, because she thought she's going to see her death, she's going to see the death of her unborn baby, and God then gave her the promise that her baby would not only be born, but he'd become a great people, many people. And Hagar could say that it was so good to have God's promise about the future of my baby that made me feel so good that Hagar could say it was the mercy of God that my heart was broken for my baby. And as Hagar looked back over her life, Hagar could see one mercy after another. Hagar could say, when you look at my life, and she's just talking to us today, Hagar would say, when you look at my life, don't say the mercy of God. Say the mercies of God. She'd say, don't say the mercy of God. Say the mercy of God because that's what my life has been, one mercy after another. She would say, the mercy of God has come to me like a flock, a great flock. She could say, the mercy of God is coming to me like the waves on the beach. As soon as one comes in, here comes another one right after it. That's one right after another. That's the mercies of God to me. That's why when God spoke of marrying Israel, who had been so sinful, so rebellious, so rejecting of the Lord Jesus Christ, but when he spoke of marrying her, when, when Israel had become a prostitute, spiritually speaking, and God told Hosea, go marry a prostitute. Mm. Boy, that's something to show how God feels about Israel and, 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 and in their unfaithfulness to him. And in the book of, I, of Hosea, when God speaks about marrying Israel, he says in Hosea 2.19, For I will betroth thee unto me forever, yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. Mercies. So God would say, don't say mercy. Hosea, when you write that, say mercies. And right along with Hagar, when Israel responds back to God, Israel says to God in Daniel 9, 9, to the Lord our God belong mercies, mercies, not mercy, mercies, and forgivenesses. 
<laughs> they said that. <laughs> Though we have rebelled against him. Israel says, don't say mercy, say mercies. And when we look back at our days, and starting from the morning of our days, Jeremiah teaches us to, along with Hagar, say these words in, Jer in Lamentations 3, 22 through 23. It is of the Lord's mercies. Don't say mercy. It's of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions, don't say compassion, say compassions, fail not. They, don't say it, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. See, it's looking at the mercies of God, the compassions of God that are new. And you look at all them and their abundance and you say, great is God's faithfulness. Jeremiah teaches us, don't say mercy of God. When you read, when you read and write my verses, say mercies of God. It's of the Lord's mercies. And when we see the Lord Jesus Christ returning to rescue Jerusalem, from all of the enemies that are going to come against him, all the people, we see him coming and he's saying in the beginning of the book of the rescue of Jerusalem, which is Zechariah, in Zechariah 1.16, he says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in, saith the Lord of hosts. So as God's coming to rescue Jerusalem, God says, Don't say I'm returned with mercy, but say, like, say it, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. And Paul teaches us. He says, look, when you talk about God, he says, call him, and he teaches us what to call him in 2 Corinthians 1 to 3, where he said, blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. God, and so Paul would say to us, don't call God the Father of mercy. Call him the Father of mercies. And the one who taught us the most to speak about the mercies of God is David, king of Israel. He's the one who taught us the most with all these psalms in Psalm 6, 4. Save me for thy mercy's sake in Psalm 25, 6. Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindnesses, for they are, have been ever of old. For Psalm 40, verse 11. Withhold not thy tender mercies from me. Psalm 44, 26. Arise for our help and redeem us for thy mercy's sake. And this, the psalm where he comes back to God after the terrible sin of lusting after another man's life, killing him so that he can take her, Psalm 51, he says, what's his basis of Psalm 51, 1? Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy mercies, tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Psalm 69, 16, turn unto me according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Psalm 89, one, the one we sing. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. With my mouth I'll make known his faithfulness to all generations. Psalm 103, verse 4, God says, he, he crowns you with tender mercies. 106, 7, he's speaking about Israel, and he said, they didn't understand. They remembered not the multitude of thy mercies, but provoked him at the sea, even at the Red Sea. Psalm 106, 45, he says, he remembered for them, for Israel, his covenant, and repented according to the multitude of his mercies. God did that. Psalm 119, 41. Let thy mercies come also unto me, O Lord, even thy salvation according to thy word. And then verse 77 of Psalm 119. Let thy tender mercies come unto me that I may live. And then Psalm 119, 50, 156. Great, great, he says, are thy tender mercies, O Lord. Psalm 145, 9, the Lord is good to all and his tender mercies over all his works. And Jacob, when he's begging God to save his life, in Genesis 32, he thought, I'm a goner for sure. As he's looking at Esau coming after him with 400 men to finish him off. He comes to God in, Psalm, in Genesis 32, 10, and he says, I'm not worthy of the least of all thy mercies. And when Paul begs us, and he says to us, be reasonable. Be reasonable and present your body as a living sacrifice to God. He says it this way in, in Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So, he got, so Paul is saying to us, don't just consider the mercy of God, but consider all the mercies of God. And Hagar, along with Jacob, along with the people of Israel, along with King David, along with Paul, could sit down and, and make a long list of the mercies of God. And the challenge is, what about us? 
is it, that's a good exercise to sit down with pen and paper and to write down the list of the mercies of God to us. And the greatest of all the mercies of God was that he spared us from the hell we deserved by his voluntary death, by the voluntary submission when God became a man, the Lord Jesus Christ, and died for our sins. No greater mercy than that. No mercy makes us a greater, what the hymn writers said, debtor, as he wrote, a debtor to mercy alone. Of covenant mercy I sing, nor fear with thy righteousness on my person and offering to bring the terrors of law and of God with me can have nothing to do. My Savior's obedience in blood hide all my transgressions from view. So now, as we look at, at Hagar here, and we see her, and she's come to this place, and we're back in Genesis 16, and we see her in, in Genesis 16, 13. She's absolutely amazed. She's looking at the mercies of God. She's amazed that God should take care of her. And she says in verse 13, she called the name of the Lord. She gives, calls him the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou, God, seest me. You see me? For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? She just can't believe it. She just can't believe it. She looks at her life. She sees how she's ruined her life through her stupid, foolish pride. And she sees the mercies of God. That, and, 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 and one particular mercy just stands out to her right now, and it's the fact that God sees her and God heard her. And she's so shocked at this mercy of God to have taken notice of her that she gives God this name. She says, that's, that's my name. The name I'm going to give to God is, is Thou God Seest Me. She's filled with wonder that God has cared so much for her. She turns around, she asks herself this question. She says, boy, he sees me. Have I cared about him? Do I, do I take him seriously? Have I bothered to care about God? That's their question. And she saw, you know, that's a question that she was not alone in asking. The father of missions is, many people think that Carey is the father of missions. Actually, William Carey, the English Baptist preacher, William Carey, he actually said the real father of modern missions is a man named Count Zizendorf. Zizendorf was born many years before him in the year 1700. And Count Zizendorf's life totally changed when he went into a, when he went into the, well, now it's a state art museum, but anyway, when he went to the state art museum in Dusseldorf, and there he, he came and he was looking at the paintings. He came to a painting by an Italian painter, Fetti. And the painting, which, don't go to Dusseldorf and look for it, because now they moved it to Munich. But anyway, <clears throat> still there, go to Munich and see it. So the, the painting is, is by Fetti was of the Lord during his sufferings. It's a face of the Lord during his sufferings. When Pilate presented him to the people, and Pilate said, behold the man. So that's what, that's what Feti wrote in Latin, Ecce Homo, Behold the Man. And, and, and then at the bottom of this painting is there's an inscription in Latin, and it, said, it reads this. It says, This have I suffered for you. Now what will you do for me? That's what it says. And when Count Zissendorf, and who was in Germany, in Dusseldorf there, and he saw that, he dropped to his knees and in the middle of the museum there, and with tears, he committed his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, before this time, he was happy-go-lucky. He was on the Wanderjahr. He, he, he was uh, the, uh, the, year, the, the gap year before he was going to get serious and do whatever he was going to do and, and make his career. And he was traveling all around Germany, just having a good time and in, 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 in all throughout Germany, he says, oh, why not go to this art museum? And he went to the art museum in Dusseldorf, and everything changed for him. As an abrupt halt to it came to him as he, really the impact of Romans 12, 1 and 2 fell on him. And he said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, as we've said, present your bodies. And that's what he did. And it caused Count Zissendorf to consider the mercies of God. And right there in the museum, he drops to his knees. He doesn't care who's looking at him. And, he, and, he, and from that point on, Count de Zissendorf was determined that his life was not going to be molded or, by the world, but he was gonna, that his mind was going to be renewed and his life was going to be transformed. And he was going to be able to prove in his life 
what was for him God's good and acceptable and perfect will for his life. And he established many missions and hospitals. And over 100 years later, Francis Havigail saw the same painting, still in Dusseldorf at that time, and the painting inspired her to write the hymn, I gave my life for thee. I gave my life for thee, my precious blood I shed, that thou mightst ransom be and raised up from the dead. I gave, I gave my life for thee, what hast thou given for me? I gave, I gave my life for thee, what hast thou given for me? I suffered much for thee, more than thy tongue can tell, of bitterest agony to rescue thee from hell. I've borne, I've borne it all for thee, what hast thou borne for thee, for me? I've borne, I've borne it all for thee, what hast thou borne for me? That's the question of Hagar. That's what she's asking herself in verse 13. God did all this for me? He cared for me? What have I done for him? Have I looked after him? Now, she so wanted this to be ever and ever a place of a change in her life that she named the well, this, this name, Be Be Beer Laharoi, so that she would never forget that's where she gave her life to the Lord Jesus Christ, Jehovah Jesus. So she names it, literally, the well of the one who sees. The well of the one who sees. She, so as she, for the rest of her life, whenever she, she would think about, there is a well. There is a well in the middle of a desert where God saw me, and I gave my life to Jehovah Jesus there at that well. And then as maybe by time, who knows, sometimes time, she may find herself back to it, or maybe close to it. And she would say, you know, i got to go to that well. And she'd go by that well, and she could imagine her kneeling down at that well and saying, Lord, you've never changed. You've always continued to see me. And I'm going to keep on asking myself the question, the question of this well. Have I looked after you? Have I given my life to you? What was the response that I'm using my life for because you have done so much for me? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for Hagar and for that you saw her, you found her, you saw her, you turned her around, Lord. We thank you so much, Lord, for repentance and, and the ability to come back to God. We thank you so much, Lord, for writing down all these things for our learning, Lord, and we thank you so much for your precious Holy Spirit who teaches us the truths in your word. In Jesus' name, amen.